Oh, come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you guys. Come on, San Diego, give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord. Say, Lord, we're back. No, come on, say, Lord, we're back. We want some more. My mind is ready. My heart is open. Ready to receive. I believe. I believe. You have a miracle for my life. Speak into my heart. In Jesus' name. Now give the Lord a good hand of praise. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. We had a great time yesterday, as uh, Pastor Al mentioned. You want me to mention next Sunday? Later? Okay. What is he talking about? Uh, you'll find out later. Praise the Lord. God is good. Beautiful day. Praise. How many of you, come on, how many of you forgot to adjust your clocks? See, nowadays it don't work no more because we have cell phones. Amen. So when it's 1 o'clock, all of a sudden, 3 o'clock, what the heck happened? Praise the Lord. Amen. But, uh, amen. It's great to be here and it's good to see uh, everybody here. UTC, as we mentioned, is here. And, uh, see, we teach them obedience at UTC. Amen. And then the ladies are getting excited and ready to go to. That's it. And Tuesday night, right? Tuesday night, Sister Georgina is the opening night speaker. Oh, my God. They don't do that lightly. Amen. But, you know, I, I, you watch it online, right? How many husbands watch it online? Shut up. Yes, you do. You know you do. I want to see my wife's there. And uh, I think it was last year. You preached the one last year, too. And so I got a chance to hear Sister Georgina preach. I said, oh, my God, this, this girl can preach. She is a preacher. Amen. She preached better than her mom. Amen. Better than her sister. Even better than her brother. Amen. But not better than her husband. Amen. I know how to score points, huh? <laughs> so what a what a great, great, uh, awesome privilege. And uh, uh, I know my wife's excited, and, and my daughters are excited about going, and, and it's going to be powerful. Amen? This morning, if you have your Bibles, let's get right to it. Time's kind of running on us here. You like this service, huh? You do. Yes, you do. And I know why. Not because you're so spiritual, because we're on a time clock here. Amen? We have to end at a certain time. Amen? <laughs> Uh, Acts chapter 18. Acts, the 18th chapter. And we're going to read two verses, but I want you to keep your Bible open. We're going to go back and read uh, a little bit more later on. Acts 18, verse 9 and 10. Uh, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. I want to give you four reasons. How many? Four. How many? Four. You guys are still trying to wake up just in that hour, huh? Huh? How many? Four. I'm going to give you four reasons why you should never stop coming to this church. If you're visiting, and we're blessed to have you, amen. On behalf of Victor Harris, we're blessed to have you visiting from another church, amen. Uh, your title would be Four Reasons Why I Never to stop serving God. But I was reading this morning a little bit on it. I did a little bit more background check. His name was John Stephen, and I hope I pronounce this properly, Arkawi. And that sounds kind of like, sounds. I thought it was an Indian name, but he's actually Tanzanian. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly either. From Africa, Tanzanian. Where's my African buddy over here? There you are. Tanzanian, is that how you say it? Christmas, you're from Sierra Leone. Tanzania is way on the other side. Okay. And John Stephen Arkali, that's his name, was the only representative from the country of Tanzania to come and run and compete in the 1968 Olympics being held in Mexico City. Now, he never adjusted to the heat and the altitude in Mexico City in his training. So he cramped up. His, his venue was the marathon, 26-mile race. And he cramped up real bad. 
and it caused him to fall. And he busted up his knee real bad. Most runners would have stopped, gave up, called the ambulance, 911 and in, 911, and that's it, it's over. He stayed in the race. He got up and kept running. Now, I wish I could tell you he won, but homeboy came in dead last. I mean, when he entered the stadium, there weren't even this many people there. However, the cameras picked it up because it was a human interest story. So as he hobbled in for that final lap in Mexico City, everybody kind of cheered him on. They kind of knew what had happened. And he crossed the finish line and collapsed. So the reporters and the news cameras went up to him and they said, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you give up? And here's what he said, and these are his exact words. My country did not send me 9,000 miles just to start this race. How many know here in Victoria, San Diego, we're not here just to start something. We're going to finish what God has called us to do. Yet throughout the years that I've been a part of this ministry, I've seen a lot of quitters. I've seen a lot of starters, and I've seen a lot of you start. Uh, I remember when Pastor Al got saved, Sister Georgina got saved, right? When Miller got saved, Todd got saved, right? A number of you, when David got saved, Crispin got saved, Pittsburgh, California. I've seen you start, but also I've seen a lot of people quit. Well, I'm going to give you four reasons why you should never quit on God. Here in our scripture, Paul the Apostle has just come from the city of Corinth. Corinth was a city kind of like San Diego. It was a seaport city. Difference is it had three seaports. You guys have one. And if you were involved in business in those days, you probably got your goods from Corinth. That's where all the goods came, spices and silver and material, all that stuff would come in there. And if you were in business in those days, you would travel there to Corinth to get your goods to take back to your homeland to sell. And it was said there in Corinth, they had these, what you and I would call malls, right? Marketplaces, they call them those days. And you would walk down these marketplaces and there would all, the, all these shops selling leather, gold, spices, silver, whatever. And however, competition was very stiff, right? So they would hire, the owners would hire what we call barkers. You know what a barker is? That's a barker, somebody stands in front of the circus, come see the, the bearded lady, come see the midget with fire in his ear, or whatever, you know. That's a call to barker. Okay, so competition was so stiff that owners tried to hire the best barkers, the most eloquent speakers they could find. Right? And it was said that if you wanted to hear some of those eloquent speakers in those days, you go to Corinth and hear these salesmen with their pitches. That's why Paul the Apostle said, when I came to you, I didn't come with no sales pitch. I didn't come with excellence of speech. I came in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's after he got the victory. That's not the whole story. Paul, just when he went to Corinth, prior to going to Corinth in our chapter here, in the 17th chapter, he was in the city of Athens. Very good, Athens. Somebody reads their Bible here. <laughs> Apparently it's only a pastor that reads it, amen. Athens, you're right. But when he went to Athens, he struggled. He struggled. They laughed at him. Not that he was telling jokes. It's one thing to be laughing at what you say something funny, but you don't want to be laughed at. Huh? And they called him, and this is a strange translation, uh, a seed picker, which to us doesn't mean anything, but the translation would be a babbler. Okay, you ever drive around San Diego, you see these vagabonds, homeless people? You ever listen to some of them? They don't make any sense at all. You see them in the corner talking out loud, right? What the heck are they talking to? They ain't got a cell phone. And oftentimes they're not making any, they're just babbling. That's what they call Paul. So Paul didn't start a church, didn't train any disciples, didn't develop a ministry there. In fact, he won only a handful of people, and he leaves the city of Athens totally discouraged. Uh, and now he comes to the city of Corinth. 
And later on, he tells the Corinthians, when I came to you, I came in weakness and fear and trembling. And I think it was because of what happened in, Thor, uh, in Athens. I think Paul got a little gun shy. I think it affected him where Paul reaches a point within his life and his ministry where he feels like giving up. You ever felt like giving up? Yes, you have. We've all been there. Where you reach a point within your life or in your ministry or your marriage, like we talked about yesterday, where you feel like giving up. Huh? And here, Paul, you know, when you're going through some dark, difficult times, right, you can't sleep. Not just with the hour change, as some people couldn't last night. I slept okay. People often ask, you ever, you ever have somebody ask you, so, Brother Philip, how did you sleep last night? You ever have somebody ask you that? How did you sleep? Tell them what, tell them, what I tell them, vertically. <laughs> it only works horizontal for vampires, amen? <laughs> Paul couldn't sleep, all right? And, and the Bible says God came to him in the night and ministered to him, all right? See, I think Paul was discouraged, what happened? Well, God comes to him and ministers to him. Paul reaches the point where he wants to give up. Throughout the scriptures, we find many people in the word of God wanted to give up on God. What happened to the apostle Paul? Huh? Well, we back it up to verse 1. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens. We've already talked about that, so let's move on. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, right, with his wife Priscilla, and all the Jews departed from Rome, and he came to them. Verse 3, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. They were all tent makers. That's called speed reading. Here's our key verse right here. Verse 4, stay right here. Watch. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading both Jews and Greeks. I want you to note, note, make note of the word reasoned. That word means in the English translation, argument. He presented an argument like a lawyer does before a jury. Huh? Like a debate. Huh? Now, Paul was a practicing Pharisee. We all know that. Paul's strategy was whenever he came into a city, uh, he would go into the synagogue. He had the credentials. He was allowed to. right? And he would preach and testify. But on this particular occasion, he does something he normally doesn't do. He, he gets out of his strategy. See, God has given us a strategy for impacting San Diego. And that strategy is to hit the streets, to open up homes for, for men, women, discipleship homes, right? Do evangelism. That's our strategy, to reach the, the most hurting parts of the city, right? Pastor Al doesn't want to be the mayor. He just wants to be his pastor, amen? In other words, we just want to win souls. That's our strategy. But I think here, because of what happened in, in Athens, Paul's kind of lost a little bit of that cutting edge. I think he's lost a little bit of that joy. I think he's lost a little bit of that fire. Have you lost some of your fire this morning? Is your blade a little dull this morning? Huh? Do you feel kind of out of it this morning? See, I think Paul is over there trying to argue and debate with the Jews to convince them about Christ. Huh? And I think Paul is like, he just reaches a point where he feels like giving up. But then something wonderful happens, right? Look how God deals with him. Something wonderful happens. Look at verse 5, right? When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. You know, whenever you're going through something, God has a way of directing the right person into your life. Either through a phone call, or you run up to him in the church, or you see him in the parking lot, right? Or somebody comes to your house. For Paul's case, it was two of his disciples, Timothy and Silas. They're on their first missionary trip. They just got out of the home. They're new converts. They are pumped. They are primed. They're going to their first women's convention. I mean, they are excited. They're already packed and ready to go. Some of you ladies are already packed. And it don't even start till Tuesday, but you're ready to go. Some of you have been around for a while. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking of going. But those of you, some of you are already pumped, you're primed, you're ready, you're telling your husband, I'm leaving whether you like it or not, I'm going to Ontario to hear from God. Timothy and Silas, 
They were like new converts. Remember when you first got saved? How many of you remember when you first got saved? Shut up. Remember when you first got saved? Man, you never miss church. Man, you used to take your Bible to weddings. Aren't they going to preach? Remember when you first got saved? You sang every song, gave in every offering, attended every event. When they said, we're going to go to the streets and pass out flyers, I'm ready. Come on, somebody. Remember when you first got saved? Everything. Everything was sin to you. Man, shut that TV off. That's sin. If you started eating and you forgot to say grace, spit it out. We forgot to pray. Now what do we do after we've eaten half our lunch and we've already eaten and we didn't even pray? Okay, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that went in me. It was an evangelist by the name of Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith, yeah. Started preaching at the age of 17 in England. Died at the age of 89. They have a, actually have a statue of him in Walthamstow, England. And it was said when he was 89 years old. Next weekend, you're going to have a 92-year-old preacher, Brother Sherul, and he's still got the fire. Man, when I'm 92, I hope I still have a little bit of fire in me. Half of what he has, amen. Huh? Well, Gypsy Smith, they asked him, what is it now? Here you are, 89 years old, and you're still full of fire and zeal and excitement. What's the secret? Here's what he said. I never lost the wonder. You know what the wonder is? It's your first airplane trip. Your first time going to a ball game. Your first time going to Disneyland or SeaWorld. Huh? Your first time seeing the ocean. I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. My first time seeing was Long Beach. We're like, oh my God, look at all the water. I had never seen the ocean before. Now I fly over oceans all the time. Right? You go on planes all the time. Been to ball games all the time. But you don't have to lose the wonder of serving God. There's an old song that says, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And so look what happens here. Timothy and Silas show up. And the Bible says Paul is compelled. Everybody say the word compelled. That means the Holy Spirit's pushing him. Like behind him saying, come on, man, snap out of it. I want to take this city. I want to impact this city. Now you get back over there. And Paul goes back to the synagogue, not to argue, not to debate, but he goes back testifying. I want you to know I was a Pharisee of Pharisees on a dusty road to Damascus. But one day a light shined from heaven. Jesus knocked me down before he picked me up. How did that happen? Four reasons why you should never give up. Number one, God is real. Let's go back to Acts chapter 18, verse 9. God comes to Paul in the night in a vision. I know what you're thinking, guy. I used to think the same thing. How come when I'm going through stuff, I don't get a vision like God, like Paul did? Huh? Because we got this. See, Paul didn't have this. But to me, I look at that because the Bible says God appears to Paul in the night in a vision. To me, that's a clear demonstration of how real our God is. We're not serving just a philosophy, a truth, a principle, a set of Ten Commandments. Our God is real. He is alive and well, and he's real. My favorite story to tell, and it's a true story, but it's my favorite. Involves another evangelist who passed away last year, whom I just had the most respect for, Billy Graham. Dr. Graham was in a crusade someplace and had a press conference, and a reporter asked him, raised his hand, and said, Dr. Graham, have you ever seen God? He said, no. He said, well, that's my point. How can you stand up there night after night in front of thousands of people? You preach to more people than any other person on earth, even Jesus. How can you stand up there night after night telling people about God when you've never seen him? How do you know? How do you know God exists? How do you know he's real? Answer me. Dr. Graham said, I'll answer your question. How do you know when you have a backache? 
The porter said, excuse me? Yeah, how do you know you have a backache or a headache? Do you see your headache? <laughs> do you see your backache? He said, no, well, how do you know when you have a backache? He says, well, I can feel it. He said, I know there's a God in heaven. I know Jesus is alive. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit because I can feel it. How many feel God here? Now, to be honest with you, I don't feel God every day. But I know he's real. Number two. Second reason. He tells Paul, and this is the second reason why you should never stop coming to this church. Number one, God is real here. Number two, God is with you, San Diego. This church is one of our oldest churches in all the ministry. This church has known good times and difficult times, just like our home church. huh? But San Diego has gone through it, and you've bounced back, taking it to the next level. Why? Why? Well, because Pastor Sonny was here. No. Well, because we have Pastor Al No, they'll be the first ones to tell you. It's because Jesus is with you. God is with you, Victory Outreach San Diego. Every time I read that, I think of Joshua. Take it over for, for Moses. Shoot, that's some big shoes to fill. Moses died. God said, okay, Joshua, you're in charge. <laughs> God. I can't I can't fill those shoes. Uh-huh. I mean Moses, he confronted Pharaoh, split open the Red Sea, got the Ten Commandments, made a movie. I mean, come on. Okay, he didn't make a movie. The movie part I threw in. And God said, Hey, Mo Joshua, as I was with Moses in the wilderness, so shall I be with you. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for I, the Lord, thy God, am with you. God is with us. God is with Victory Arch International. God is with Victory Arch San Diego. God is with you. 1978. Some of you weren't even born, huh? Okay, I'm not going to ask. Um, I went to work for a fella. I was still traveling as an evangelist, but then I was asked to help out Nicky Cruz. You might have heard of him. <laughs> and I became his National Crusade director. So we're on the plane flying to some city. I don't even remember. We're going to speak at some banquet. He's going to speak, and I'm there on the plane. He's up there in first class. I'm back there in coach with all the poor people. But it's okay. The whole, the whole plane landed at the same time. We get to the airport. This wasn't a Victor Arch event. It wasn't a Victor Arch event. So they sent a car with four guys to come pick up Nikki. And they're like in awe of him. They're like, wow, Nikki Cruz, run, baby, run, cross those way. Nikki, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. And trust me, Nikki loves it. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus love you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus love you. Jesus love you. Jesus love you. <laughs> And they get his luggage. They say, we have a car to take you to the hotel. And it was a small little Datsun or something. Nissan, Datsun. Remember, remember they were called Datsuns? Anyway. So they escort me to the car. Then I come off the plane. I go, guys, what about me? And they say, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm Philip LaCruz. Well, whoop did it. <laughs> right there, I discerned. They were going to get my luggage. That's okay. That's okay. I got my luggage. What I was really concerned about is I wanted a ride to the hotel. I go, guys, uh, is there room for me in that car? We didn't know you were coming. I said, what? They said, yeah, we didn't know you were coming. Well, how am I going to get to the hotel? Take the shuttle. That's what I said. I didn't say it like that, though. I said, what? Yeah, you take the shuttle. You get over there. Nikki gets out of the car and says, hey, 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 he's with me. They said, of course we'll get your luggage, Brother Philip, amen. I said, you better get my luggage. You don't know where I'm from. I'm from Victory Outreach. I'll call the men's home. And I won't have them wash this car, I'll have them thrash it. 
We get to the hotel. They give Nikki his suite. I go up to the front desk, and they ain't got no room for me. I'm sorry, we're all filled up. We didn't know you were coming. We don't have a reservation for you. Nikki, I go, what? Nikki turns around, hey, 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 he's with me. She says, of course you can have a room, Mr. LaCroix. I said, you better give me a room, lady. You don't know where I'm from. I'm from Victory Outreach. I know two backsliders that love to come and burn this place down. That is so bad. That is so bad, but that is so true. <laughs> I get up to my room, I unpack, I'm running behind, get my clothes ready. I get down to the banquet hall. Nikki's already in there. I get to the entrance. This 900 pound usher stands at the door. Georgina, do you remember Big Ralph? Yeah, Big Ralph. He used to be one of our ushers way back in Glen Street. You were small. This guy would make Big Ralph look like a midget. Anyway, um, this guy stands at the door, and I get in. I go, excuse me, excuse me. He won't, he won't let me in. He says, where's your ticket? Now, I'm having one of those kind of days. How many of you have ever had one of those kind of days? <laughs> let me explain. I've left all my fruits in the room. My joy, my peace, my long-suffering, my patience, my brotherly kindness, my charity. I am operating on pure grace. I said, I don't need no ticket. I flipped him off. I don't need no ticket like this. I don't need no ticket. He paid a debt. He did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. For you young people, that's an old chorus we used to sing. Remember that one? He said, well, Jesus may have paid for your soul, but he didn't pay for this banquet. You got to have a ticket. <laughs> Nikki stands up, hey, let him in. He's with me. The guy says, of course you come in. I said, you better let me in. You don't know where I'm from. I'm from Victory Outreach. And I'll get in the flesh and I'll beat the fat off you. I'm just kidding. That, I'm just kidding, because I was bluffing. That guy would have killed me with his little finger. You know, it's going to happen. It's going to happen to us because we're victory outreach. Uh, especially those of us that are ex-drug addicts, ex gang It's going to happen to us. I'm going to be standing before the throne of God, and the devil's going to show up on my court day. The Bible says the devil has access to the presence of God. Read the book of Job. The Bible also says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. On my day, and probably your day, I'm going to stand right there, and the devil's going to say, Father God, you can't let Philip LaCroix into heaven. This man was a drug addict. This man lied, cheated, and stole, broke all the Ten Commandments. If there had been 15 commandments, he would have broke them. He hasn't done nothing to deserve heaven. Guess what? You and I haven't done nothing to deserve heaven. You and I have broken all Ten Commandments. Because the Bible says you break one, you break them all. You and I don't deserve heaven. Sure, we're in trouble, huh? But then Jesus is going to step in and say, Father, he's with me. He's with me. He's with me. Oh, God is with you, Victory Outreach San Diego. God is with you. Number three, God will protect you. You know, you meet other Christians. How many know other Christians from other churches? San Diego is a great city, and there's a lot of believers here. Where do you go to church? Baptist. Oh, praise the Lord. We love the Baptist. John was one. What about you? Assembly of God. Ooh, Assembly of God. Right. Four square. Oh, yeah, Jack Hayford, four square, yeah. I go to Calvary Chapel. Hallelujah. 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 Then they come to you and they ask you, where do you go to church? And you say, and they say, ooh. Are you the ones over there off of 43rd? Yeah. 
Right there in the neighborhood? Are you the drug addict church? Are you the one reaching gang member? Are you the one that got all kinds of ex-criminals in the sanctuary? Yes, that's us! Aren't you afraid? Your kids are going to get AIDS or some disease there with all these drug addicts there. Your daughter there, right? When you guys go to the streets, Chicano Park. Huh? Don't you guys get... No, God is with us. God protects us. I've raised all my kids in this ministry. Yesterday was living proof that we are a family ministry. This place was packed out. People wanting to come and build their family. Come on, somebody say amen. God protect. I've had bomb threats. I've had threats on the street. I actually had a bomb threat. I was in Southgate doing a rally, and they introduced me. And I got up, and there were about 1,000 people, there were about 12 pastors. There was an a interdenominational rally, and I started praying. I said, okay, let's pray. Father, I'm praying. While I'm praying, the MC comes out. And whispers in my ear while I'm praying, God, move by your power, move by your spirit. Brother Philip, the LAPD, uh, the, the sheriff's department, fire department, the bomb squads outside, we've had a bomb threat called in. God, move by your What did you say? <laughs> they want you to clear the building so they can bring the dogs in to sniff for bombs. But don't cause a panic. He says, you want me to do it? I go, no, I'll do it. How many here are ready to meet the Lord right now? 800 people raise their hand. Yeah, I go, then you may be seated. The rest of you that are not right with God, we've had a bomb threat called in. I need you to exit the building. As soon as I said that, the choir got up and ran out. The pastors ran out. The worship team ran out. But we're still here. I had a knife pulled on me in San Bernardino Victory Outreach. A guy came and sat right where you're sitting, Tim. A vagabond guy pulled out a knife and started making gestures. He was sticking to me. And there was a pastor. His name was Pastor Cal. My old buddy. Me and him went in the home the same day. He's sitting right over there. And I'm trying to get his attention to look over there. Because I could have done this. No! But look where the ushers are at. Where are they? Look, look where you're at. Look over here. Raise your hand. By the time you get up here and save us, we'll have the funeral already. We know way back there. So I look at Cal and I'm trying to go. I try to be slick. You know, the word of God is like a two-edged sword. Didn't work. You know, the word of God, it cuts like a knife. Pastor Cal taking notes. I said, you know when the word of God cuts, it cuts deep. But we're still here. We've gone to some of the most dangerous ghettos in the country, and we're still here. We go into Watts. We go into Cabrini, Greece. We go into the Bronx, New York. We go into South Africa. We go into Panama. We go into Brazil. We go into the Philippines, and God protects us. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I got about two minutes left. Let's go. You didn't believe me? You had to look at the clock, really? You think I'm lying over here? Two minutes. The guy looked at the clock. Uh, number four. Number one, God is real. That's why you should never stop coming to this church. Number two, God is with you. Number three, God's going to protect us here. And number four, you're part of God's family. If, if, if anything ever is so true to me, it's a victory average. We're one big family. We don't always get along. Family fights. Yes, we do. But we also forgive. We learn to forgive each other. Paul, I'll close with this as the worship team comes, felt alone and abandoned. 
And God says, listen, you're not by yourself. Because, you know, when you're going through hard times, you have a tendency to focus, listen very carefully, on how you feel instead of the facts. You feel all alone. You feel nobody understands. You feel like nobody cares. But those aren't the facts. That's how you feel. But those aren't the facts. The facts are we do understand. We do care. And the fact is nobody, you're not alone going through it. You've gone through it, I've gone through it. You've had pain, I've had pain. You've suffered loss, I've suffered loss. You've been embarrassed, I've been embarrassed. You've gotten, you've been knocked down, I've been knocked down, but you get back up. Come on, somebody, say amen. God comes to Paul. He says, listen, for you're not alone, I have many people in this city. So you're not by yourself. You're part of a wonderful family. Man, we got family all over the world now. I mean, you can go to almost any major city in the world, and you'll find Victoria's there. Oftentimes, I go online. When I'm out of town, I'll go online to check my flight reservations. And I fly a lot on United. And so they'll ask me a security question. And one of the security questions they always ask me on the Internet, what was the first major city I ever visited? It was right here in San Diego. My, my parents brought me here when I was a little boy. Came to look at the ships. Then we drove right back. We had no money. Amen. Uh, we have family all over the place. You go to Phoenix, Victoria's there. You go to Denver, Victoria's there. You go to Chicago, Victoria's there. You go to New York, we're there. You go to Florida, we're there. You go to Cuba, we're there. Now, we're not in Russia yet. I said, yet. We're not in China. We're not in South Korea. We're not in the v- Vietnam. But we're coming. Because God is raising up an army. It's not time to quit. As the worship team comes, it's not time to quit. It's not time to give up. It's time to rise up. It's time to stand up. It's time to say, you know what? I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm throwing up the blood-raised hands. Hallelujah. The blood-stained banner of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.